We're coming up on the closing bell, and we have our market panel here to make sense of the trading we've seen so far today. John Lynch is Comerica Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer, and Michael Jones is Caraville Concepts CEO. But before we speak with you both, we want to get one last check of the markets before the closing bell. Taking a look here at the stock action, we do have the Dow narrowly in positive territory, up just over 20 points as we speak. The S&P 500 up about 0.245 percentage points, and the NASDAQ also up by about 0.2%, building on gains that we've seen over the past couple of days as we have this tech rebound continue. Continuing. Materials, consumer discretionary, and information technology are the outperformers in the S&P 500. And here's the closing bell. All right. Don't get in a fight with her either. That gavel swing was pretty good. Let's see where we're going to settle today. The Dow going to be up about 39 points. The S&P 500 up about a quarter percent, up 13 points. NASDAQ's going to settle up about 35 points, up a quarter of a percent. Let's get to the panel right now. And let's start off uh, with, let's start with Michael. want to ask you, if the economy is going to stay strong, that doesn't mean every sector is going to do well in 2022, or does it? Where should we as investors be focusing if the economy still continues to perform? Well, our, in our 2022 outlook, we felt like that investors who are old and experienced, like John and I, Happy New Year, John. Uh, Good to see you, Mike. We, we were going to get a strong sense of deja vu because we felt like similar market conditions as we saw in 2000 was gonna to lead to similar market outcomes in 2022. What are those conditions? You've got a strong economy, but you also have a pricey market that's encountering a tightening Fed and decelerating earnings growth. That suggests to us, as in 2000, that the speculative high flyers are gonna have problems, and so far this year, they are, and the boring low volatility dividend names that were left out of the exciting rally of 98, 99, left out of the exciting rally of 2000, 2020, 2021, those are gonna be the star performers held up by the strong economy and not as dramatically impacted by the Fed draining liquidity out of financial markets. John, taking a look at this morning's CPI print, 7% on that headline number, the fastest rate since 1982. Is this the peak rate of inflation you expect to see, or do we still have a little bit further to go in early 2022? I think we have a little more to go. Tomorrow's wholesale price index, the producer price index, should give us a good indication. But I think that the 7% print was largely priced into the equity markets. I don't think anyone was too surprised by that. I'm very encouraged by a couple of things that really weren't talked about too much today was that China's factory prices were down also last night So I th for the past month. So I think that's a positive development about the global supply chain issue, even though they've locked down yet another city. But another indication, market-based indicator, is that 10-year uh, break-even inflations have come in pretty good, call it 2.5, 2.52% over the past couple of days, and that's down from a high of 277. So that's telling me the market believes the Fed is going to uh, stop this uh, inflationary threat over the longer term. There's a lot of confidence there. Uh, John, when you talk about that uh, Fed commitment, we even had Jay Powell say, we'll rein it in. If, let's right. say we break the 2% threshold that everyone's been saying eventually is going to happen. We still essentially have negative you know, real interest rates. What does that mean for those of us who want to put our money somewhere? That's really not going to change vastly in 2022, is it? Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. I think the, the real yield, I wrote a report a couple of weeks ago and called it stock's best hope. And even though the many challenges that Michael highlighted with the uh, comparisons to 2000, uh, we are less absurdly priced than the rest of the world when you think about our 10-year treasury. And when you factor in inflation adjustment, we could see three rate hikes this year and the real yield will still be negative. That is still looking at historically average profit growth, discounted near historic lows in rates. And it also uh, provides U.S. equities with less asset class competition globally. Michael, as you mentioned, your outlook for 2022 is that things are going to look a lot like 2000. I'm wondering, when do you expect that potential negative catalyst to come again for tech stocks, similar to what we saw last week as markets reacted to the Fed's December meeting minutes? Well, my memory of 2000 and, and often in, when the Fed changes policy substantially, 
is that investors are very cavalier about the switch in policy until it really starts to bite, until the Fed really starts to drain liquidity from financial markets. And I think it's important to draw from Powell's testimony yesterday that he's not just looking at raising interest rates. He's also looking at shrinking the Fed's balance sheet at, quote, a much faster pace than they did after QE. And let's remember how that story ended. In 2019, the Fed was shrinking its balance sheet, trying to get back to a, a pre-QE kind of posture. And that ran afoul of a trillion dollar budget deficit. The bond market collapsed in September of 2019. Overnight repo hit 10 percent. And the Fed had to ride to the rescue of the Trump administration by cranking up the printing press. In 2022, are we going to be any more successful in funding a trillion dollar deficit with the Fed shrinking its balance sheet even faster? And with the Fed maybe constrained in riding to the rescue by that inflation pressure that we've seen. It looks to me like we're going to have more liquidity demanded than it's going to be available as the Fed starts shrinking its balance sheet. That's when the real correction begins in those speculative names. Uh, Michael, I want to follow up on that because when you talk about correction and you talk about liquidity demand, 8.8 .8 trillion is available. It's going to take a huge amount of roll off to really create the kind of, wouldn't it, kind of correction that you're just hinting at? Because I, 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 when's it coming? It's not going to hit this year. Well, remember that that 8.8 .8 trillion has already been allocated and there's another trillion that's going to need to be borrowed this year. And it's at the margin that liquidity demands happen. The, the liquidity that the Fed provided to the market over the last several years, that's allocated, that's out into the system. That's one of the reasons why we're sitting here with Apple at eight times sales. As you have the continued demand for liquidity coming out of the Treasury, needing to fund those trillion dollar deficits, you're going to not have new money coming in. The Fed's going to be pulling money out. And I think something will have to give. And it's important to recognize that I don't see this as some kind of you know, Armageddon. In 2000, the market was only down 5 or 10%, with most of that decline focused in the most speculative high flyers. We see a very similar type of outcome this year. John, a number of economists have now raised their expectations for interest rate hikes to take place from the Fed four times this year, given the inflation backdrop. But at least based on your notes to us earlier today, you still see three interest rate hikes. What's your case for this as opposed to more aggressive action by the Fed this year? Well, Michael has tapped into our experience. And uh, I have to admit that, you know, looking at, you know, the, the 1990s examples, uh, you know, the bond market vigilantes had an awful lot to do with reigning in the Federal Reserve. And I think it's conceivable this year you could see equity market vigilantes reigning in the Fed this year. If you see three rate hikes, you know, those those rate hikes could be accompanied by, for example, a thousand point down day in the Dow, right, just to send a message to Powell. Uh, I also think that, you know, we have new members coming on board of the Fed. It's conceivable we see, we see more dovishness uh, from the Fed. It's possible also when you the Fed, even though their mandate is inflation and, and jobs, they have to factor in currency, they have to factor in trade, uh, uh, financing costs of U.S. debt, you know, 1% increase in financing costs on a $22 trillion debt load. That's $220 billion in additional uh, costs for uh, U.S. Treasury. So I think that uh, the combination of all those things could see, and then we have the Omicron uh, variant, right? So we have to be mindful of that as well. So I think it's conceivable that uh, the Fed is going to have to raise three times this year. Uh, I don't believe we're going to see the classic lengthy uh, multi hike, multi year tightening cycle as a result of the reasons I just highlighted. Uh, John, I just want to touch upon something because we're waiting for We're going to get Delta earnings tomorrow, uh, earnings season well underway. And, and you're looking at this year uh, a deceleration, obviously, from what we've seen uh, in 2021. But still, profit gains of up to 25 percent in the fourth quarter, three times greater than average, but a sharp deceleration from prior quarters. What's that setting us up for first quarter of 2022? I think first quarter or really throughout the full year, I think you're going to see more historically average growth. So it's going to be, I believe, you know, similar to what Michael's saying about what interest rates can do and what that can do mean for multiples. I don't think we're going to see multiple expansion. I think that the uh, long duration, low margin, 
uh, speculative assets are going to struggle. But I do think, you know, it comes down to home cook and I think it's going to be value. I think it's going to be dividends. I think it's going to be earnings and income compounded annually. And I think we can finish up fairly valued in the S&P in that 5,000 range uh, by the end of the year. But uh, I'm also fairly confident it's not going to be a straight line. I think there's going to be a lot of volatility associated with it. We haven't even mentioned uh, the midterm election in this conversation yet, and there tends to be an awful lot of volatility surrounding an election, but we also have a history of recovery from that volatility after the market troughs 12 months thereafter. So I think that's going to be important for investors during the volatility to adhere to their long-term strategic goals and not to trade emotionally. All right. John Lynch is Comerica Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer, and Michael Jones is Caravel Concepts CEO. We thank you both for joining us.